correspondence by describing that system in string theory in two different sets of variables and taking a low energy limit. So L string is the string length, whoops, and mu is some scale that I'm going to hold fixed. It's going to be the scale of processes I'm interested in in the field theory or in either description of the theory that we arrive at. Um, so if I look at this system from the closed string point of view, then that ends up zooming us in on the near horizon geometry. Which gives us some ADS times sphere space. And so we end up looking at string theory on ADS5 times S5 with NC units of flux, or other amount of flux. <coughs> if we instead focus on that system from the open string point of view, then the low energy limit brings us down to the field theory living on the brains, which is n equals 4 super n nils. Now the defect ADS CFT correspondence takes this system and adds an additional grain. You know, I'm not supposed to use this color chart, but I'm going to. <laughs> so I'm looking at a specific example first studied by Karch, Randall, the Wolf. Friedman and Aguri. Um, so this is a D5 brain. I take the same low energy limit of this intersecting brain system. And the D5 brain descends to different things. Um, so in this picture, it descends to a probe D5 brain, extending all the way out to the boundary, which hosts open strings on it. I forgot to draw my closed string here. And so I get a probe D5 brain on the simplest case an ADS4 times S2, which is embedded in this ADS5 times S5. From this point of view, the low energy limit isolates us to the 3 3 strings, which we had before, and the 3 5 strings. So what this is in a, from a field theory perspective is a 3 d n equals 4. So that's n equals 4 supersymmetry in 3D defect. 
on a color mention of one, some manifold, so just R12. And the statement of the defect ADS CFT correspondence is that these two systems are equivalent. And as I was mentioning, that goes back to Karch, Randall, DeWolf, Friedman, Aguri, and then also later uh, Erdmenger, Geralnik, and Kirsch. So what we did, essentially, is replaced Placement only took us about 120 pages to carry out. And that was the first paper. In the second paper, we refined our technique. We replaced 3 with P. So, okay, first paper. Supersymmetric nature of the intersection? Oh, yeah, we do. That will restrict Q, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But you, you can handle on both, P yes. and Q. Okay. Yes, yeah. So I'm going to get to those restrictions. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we don't want to consider just any old P and Q. So, what are the restrictions? Because we are interested in supersymmetric situations. Susie requires that the number of Neumann Dirichlet plus Dirichlet Neumann directions, which to tell you what that is, I need to introduce another parameter. Let's D be the dimension of the spatial intersection. So then this I need to be divisible by four. I is there an easy way to see that? Uh, gosh, that's the argument in Polchinski's book. Uh, something about take your ten dimensions, take eight of the spatial directions, and do rotations in in, in, in four different planes to get an intersecting grid system. The fact that those are E1 rotations is somehow telling you that you're preserving. Hopefully, these are quarter BPS configurations. It's like two. I don't remember how that argument goes. I mean, I guess another way to see it is you can look at the at, at the Kappa symmetry projectors, the two different types of brains, and ask, uh, or the, the super one super symmetry, each one preserves an isolation, and then look at the compatibility conditions. So there's one type of brain, you break it down to half, and then another brain, you break it down to half. Um, we want a local QFT um, holographic pool. So we're still treating the, the Q brains as probes, and we're back reacting what I'll call the color brains. Yeah? So I can't count. Yeah. This works for the original system? Yes, is three, because two P, is five, P, is P is 5, P is 3. P is 5, P is 3. No, sorry, P is, is 3, D is three. Two, uh, 2. D is the number of spatial directions. Oh, spatial, sorry. Of the intersection. Yeah, yeah. So P is 3, D is 2, uh, Q is 5. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to restrict ourselves to P less than or equal to 4. So you can't have holography when you have when you consider the background of the color brains, and that's interesting. Um, but uh, that it 
gets you into a uh, little string theory. And we we'll go to the proper description of the IR. So uh, we're going to restrict to P less than or equal to 4 here. Uh, and then the other restriction comes from wanting um, a default in ADS-CFT. So for that to happen, we need these defect brains to actually have a direction orthogonal to the color brains so that they extend out to the, ge out to the boundary of the geometry here in ADS. Um, and so that requires Q to be greater than this D. Now, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to study this system? Uh, before you answer that, uh, yeah. can you give us a bit more information about the geometry and the topology of the setup? Yes, so that's what's going on over here. Um, so, we're basically taking our 10 dimensions of type 2 and we're dividing them into four sets. Right? The set where we have the overlap, those are the d plus 1 directions. Um, the additional directions where the flavored guys extend and then the additional directions where the color guys extend, and then whatever's left over where nobody extends. But as a result, is the field theory uh, on the, um, the yeah. quantum field theory lives on a Minkowski yes. uh, geometry, yes. extends to infinity, yes. the world yes. volume. Yes. And the defect is also extending mm -hmm. it's on a, yeah. to infinity? That's right, that's right. Yeah, so it's a, it is a defect as opposed to like some operator insertion, some non local operator. So it extends all the way to infinity in time. In all directions. If and the defect not is all directions, but whatever whatever these d directions are. Yeah. It's just living on R1D, the defect. That's just the, the, the dimensions of the intersection. That's the simplest thing we can do. And that's what I want to do for my purposes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, as I was saying, we only are back reacting the, the, the DP brain. So this is the near horizon geometry um, for p less than less than uh, five. This is a valid expression, um, uh, and uh, I think I'm going to get into this more later. But it's conformal. So if p is three, this factor is gone, and you come back to ADS five times ADS five. If p is not three, then it's conformal to ADS p plus two uh, s a minus p. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't have um, conformal isometries. Now that's dual to the fact that the field theory is not a CFT. And so what is the field theory of, in the ambient space? Uh, it's a maximally symmetric superior At least that, uh, that's a, a, a low energy effective description. Um, yeah. Well, that's a really good question. Um, so you could try to do that, um, but then you would need to consider. Yeah. So the question is like, in what limit of parameters is this the appropriate description? Where I'm back reacting one, but I'm treating the others as probes. So that's actually the next part of that. Um, but there is a different regime of parameters where I will back react both, and I look at the fully back reacted solution, and then that would have a holographic dual, and it wouldn't be a defect CFT. It would just be some field theory that lives entirely on the intersecting dimensions because you're zooming into that that intersection as opposed to zooming into just one set of brains or the other. And then, yeah, there would also be a description where we treat the, yeah, the, uh, the color brains as probes. Yeah. Yeah. All those things. If you're willing to allow the parameters to range over all possible values, you can see all of that. Yeah. But we're going to be restricted in the range of parameters because we want to have this particular description of the system in this particular holographic divide. Now why do I want, I want to have this description? Um, so my goal, okay, so check out what's going on on this side. If I've got a stack of um, flavor brains here, then down in this ADS space, I've got multiple pro brains coincident. So I'm realizing a gauge theory, a 
non abelian gauge theory on a curved space with boundary. So this gauge theory lives on the space with boundary, the boundary is the holographic boundary. Okay. So, one, to construct and study supersymmetric gang Melsky theories on spaces with boundary. And especially classical solutions with them. Alright, but now the next question is why do you want to do that? So I'll give you a couple answers. of ADS QCB, like the Sakai Shimimoto model, uh, we're studying, uh, you know, we have some color brains which are going to generate our gauge theory for us, and then we've got a stack of flavor brains, and we have anti-brains, because we want to realize the SUNF left cross SUNF, right, global symmetry in QCB. So in QCD, um, and then we make the intersection be the whole space time of the color brain so that we have an effective, or we wrap the color brains on a circle and then we do a K-carry motion. So we get some 40 field theory, which has the content of QCD over here. Closed strings, perturbative closed string states are dual to glue balls. Perturbative open string states are dual to mesons. Baryons are solitons of these open strings. And describing those explicitly in the typical top-down models is rather difficult. So one thought is, if you have a supersymmetric setup, maybe you can understand some basic universal properties of solitons, or baryons as solitons in a holographic context. Now, the math application is boundary value problems or what are called generalized self-duality equations. So these are generalizations of the instanton equation, basically cool gauge theoretic So we can set up some interesting first order PDEs for BPS field configurations in this theory on this space with boundary. Now what could we learn using holography? So the point is that the boundary values of the yang mills higgs fields that theory are the sources for dual operators. In the defect theory over here. So what can we do? On the other hand, if I have a BPS field configuration, it's going to represent some BPS state in this theory. There must be a corresponding BPS state over here. The theories are dual. So let me study the BPS equations in this defect theory. BPS field configurations, this is what I just said, on the probe frame should map to BPS solution. But now, the 
idea is used. The boundary values of the Yang Mills Higgs fields. Will appear as background. Right? They're the sources for these operators. So they'll appear as background fields in the BPS equations. So what we can do is use integrability of these equations to constrain them. So the idea is you can use holography. So what you're going to do is from the point of view of this system over here, you've got some arbitrary boundary values for your fields, which could in fact depend in some non-trivial way on the spatial, in, you know, space and time along this deep end. Okay? How are you going to know for what types of boundary values are you going to have a solution to the system of equations? Well, not arbitrary ones perhaps. Those boundary values will appear in these system, this holographically dual BPS system over here. Integrability of those equations will lead to differential constraints on those boundary values. The fact that we should have a correspondence between solutions in the boundary theory and solutions over here is then telling you that you've got some sort of existence theorem for solutions to these gauge theoretic more precisely, an existence theorem for boundary value problems associated with these gauge theoretic problems. And that's kind of cool because there's not really been a lot of work done on that in the math literature. So there's a famous paper by Donaldson which proves the uniqueness and existence of the, for the Dirichlet problem for instantons. And then there are scattered results here and there when people have specific applications in mind. A few years ago, Witten and Matseo proved a similar existence theorem for a specific type of boundary value problem involving um, this Witten's construction and Kumana homology, which involves one of these types of generalized self-dividing equations. Uh, so that's kind of a, a mathematical application for, for doing this setup. Yes. Because we have, we're, I mean, all of these things are kind of like dimensional reductions of 10 these of free angles. So, yeah. Okay, um, so the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about when and, how, uh, and under what circumstances does this super young Mills theory give me a reasonable description of the physics in this picture? When is it the right description of the physics so that I can apply this holographic correspondence and derive results about some classical gauge theory? Okay. Um, mentioned that this idea is kind of a long-term aim for me. We're definitely not going to get there today. Okay, okay so Fortunately, for these systems, we have a good starting point. Okay, we have a good low energy effective action for the programs. And that is the Myers action. So let me remind you about that a little bit. So this is for our probe DQ brains, and I'm just giving you action for the bosonic confusing field. It's the sum of BBI, which turns Simon's action. The BBI goes like this. Tension, integral over Q plus one dimensional world volume, simplifies trace prescription, and then you've got a couple determinants. 
pull back of the block metric. Uh, yeah, I should have mentioned page field on the brain. So uh, over here, my conventions, since we're mostly focusing on the DT brain theory, those are the first sets of coordinates. All those guys are XAs. Everything that's transverse to the DQ brains, which includes two different types of you, two different types from this intersecting brain picture, we'll call those XMs. And there's also a determinant involving our scalar, our hit speeds. Now, it's known that this. This, this action gives results that are incompatible with low energy limit of string scattering amplitudes once you get to a certain order uh, in the field strength expansion and then derivatives of the field strengths. I'm not going to need to go out that far. This works well for my purpose. Um, we also have the turn assignment action, which is going to play a crucial role. So let me give that to you. Same generality. Same trace prescription, pull back. Um, this you might be less familiar with. So there's an interior product, non abelian, acting on the hormone hormone forms. So let me explain what that does. So for example, if I bring down one power of that thing, then this thing has indices M1, then Mk, it's one half the commutator. Like that. Okay. Um, So that's sort of my starting point for low energy effective description. Now what I have to do... Why is it a turn assignment? Um, the X is... Well, this, this, one not, this one transforms into a little bit of a turn assignment. Yeah. No. But just because it involves things like F1 and No, I just meant like normally, now you, normally the X's aren't there. And then if C transforms into a total derivative, then all the other things are going to Because X is closed. Oh, oh, right. But now you get yeah. things hitting X's. Yeah. Why is that not missing? Uh, I think it does. I'm not gauging very well, you're saying. Uh, oh, under, under Ramon Ramon transformations. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Well, I should assume that <laughs> Maya is the big factor. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I mean. I don't remember how it works. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, so what I want to do uh, is plug in this background. This is the background that we're trying to expand this around. I'm not actually going to do that. But I'm going to tell you the form of the result. Okay. So what happens after some work is this. metric on our DQ brains. We've got some explicit factors. Okay. So I call the radial direction transverse to the color brains V. And that's why you see all of these Vs hanging around here in the geometry. Here and here. Now the radial uh, direction, um, the part of that that's uh, transverse to, or sorry, the part of that that the DQ brains extend along, okay, so going back to the intersecting brain picture, 
these directions here are the ones that where the brain moves out to the ADS boundary. Okay, those we're calling R. These directions are transverse to both sets, so I have the option if I want to separate these two stacks of brains in those directions. So in general, I do that, and I call that vector z naught, some fixed constant. So over here in this induced metric, you see this V restricted to Z naught. So what that means, so in general, V is square root R squared plus Z squared. But if I'm restricting to my, myself to being on the brain, then V restricted to Z naught, I'm just treating that as a fixed Z. Okay. So if I choose to actually intersect them, then Z, Z naught is zero and V becomes R. <coughs> This induced geometry, if z0 is 0, is conformal to ADS um, d plus 2 times a sphere. Okay, q minus d minus 1, I think. If z0 is non zero, see I have these terms here, okay? The space is asymptotic to this thing, which is conformal to ADS times sphere. But in the interior, it's deformed. That's what z naught does in terms of the geometry. So I've got powers of like these mu v's restricted to z naught because the background, so we've got a background, dp brain background involves metric, dilaton, and remote remote. And so these particular ones are coming from the background. But the main point here is the fault. So We've got a sum, so this is an expansion. And it's an expansion controlled by these one of these parameters, epsilon p, which I can tell you what it is, and kappa bar, which is a third parameter. Okay. So let me find what was that. you again? What was you? Mu. Mu. Oh yes, yeah. so that's my energy scale. Like my arbitrary energy scale that I'm I'm choosing. So you see, for example, like in the in the geometry, mu is the ADS radius. Or in inverse mu is the ADS radius. Usually it's just set to one and people work with according to the path wrong matches. Okay. So this epsilon p. So I'll tell you what it is first. So it's alpha prime. So remember we're saying L strength is zero with respect to mu. So alpha prime is going to zero. So it's not alpha prime, it's alpha prime divided by some scale that appears in the metric. Lambda g. So there are three three constant scales here that appear in the metric, the milliton, and c. Here they are. So this has mu L strength. So the L strengths cancel. And this epsilon p is going to be finite in this low energy limit that I want to take. It's basically the basically controlling the alpha prime expansion, but it's the alpha prime expansion suited to this near horizon background geometry. So uh, when we plug things in, there are basically two kinds of parameters that appear. There's the Tuft coupling, and see. GP squared. So GP is just the dimensionless Yang Mills coupling of the P plus one dimensional super Yang Mills theory. And we're taking the low energy limit while we're holding that fixed because we wanted to study holography, so we want to have a Yang Mills theory on this brain. So this guy's going to appear in lots of places. And then this is a dimension fold. Um, so what this thing is doing is it's controlling the expansion and field strength. It's controlling the expansion of the Myers action, playing the role of the ace alpha prime here, like when we plug in the background geometry. Uh, kappa bar, that's controlling this the coupling to closed strength conservations. So it involves Newton's constant. And then this lambda phi divided by lambda g squared, it's also finite in the low energy limit. 
and it goes like 1 over n times the total couple to some power. Independent power, it's also a dimension. Finally, our Yang Mills coupling. So now this guy would be the Yang Mills coupling on the probe brains, on my DQ brain. Okay? The Yang Mills coupling for this non abelian gauge theory. So it's equal to the inverse tension, which has L strings in it. So it will be defined in the limit by itself. It's consistent, But when we plug in the background, what matters is this particular combination. And the way we get it is by looking at what's the normalization of the half squared on this expansion. So this thing ends up going like 1 over nc times the tilt coupling to a power that depends on both p and q. 10 minus p plus q over 2 times 5 minus p. And it's also dimensionful unless q is 3. If q is 3, we have a four-dimensional yeah, Mills theory. The coupling should be dimensionless. But if q is not 3, it's dimensionful. All dimensions here are being controlled by this scale. Yeah. OK, now I have to tell you what these are. Why is all the examples of twins? Why is it? Oh, sorry, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So physically, what this is, all right, so epsilon is controlling my alpha primers in expansion, my expansion higher than field strengths. This is controlling my couplings to close strings. Now, what are these Vs? Okay, that's where everything is. So I think I can probably delete this part. V two zero. Right, so mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Okay. So um NO and N C are integers, right? And what they're doing is NO is the number of field strengths or generalized field strengths, so that includes covariant derivatives of Higgs fields and commutators of Higgs fields. The number of those factors appearing in a given term. And then NC is the number of closed string fields up here. All right, so these are vertices for my effective theory. Um, V20, that will be second order in field strength, zeroth order in closed string fluctuations. That's my gauge theory. That's my naive classical gauge theory. And that's what I'm interested in. able to study that and reliably concentrate on that, I need the higher views to be suppressed. And that will happen if my expansion parameters are small. And I can arrange that, if you look at what they are, by choosing um, achieve this by taking NC and the tilt coupling large enough. So some hierarchy is necessary. But what's not so clear at all is we also do the effects of the lower order Vs to be suppressed effects of those on my theory, because okay? they're definitely there. So let's look at a few of them. Right, so first, V00, zero, zero, that's just a constant. And that's just the energy density of the background brain. That's more. V10 is actually gone. There are no open string catapults. That's because this embedding is a solution the equations of motion the embedding equations. It shouldn't be surprising because it is a super symmetric embedding. V20 
1901 are closed string tadpoles. Those we definitely have. So these are tadpoles for the graviton and everything else. So these are gravitational tadpoles. They're there because we haven't solved the equations of motion in the closed string sector. We're treating the brains as probes. And those are potentially troublesome. B11 is also not zero. But I don't care about this <coughs> because due to the trace, if I just have one open string mode in there, this is selecting out the U1 part. And I'm gonna I'm gonna concentrate on the NS and uh, S part. So this only couples. So the one at tree level. And so we'll fill this on the S U N S decouple at tree level. So what about these gravitational tabs? Do I have to worry about them or not? If you just look at the strength that goes with a B01, it can be large when you plug in NC is zero, and as one, and you look at this actual coefficient. But what that fluctuation in what you're about to read? <laughs> what fluctuations are common in the whatever NCs? Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, so when you go back to the starting point, you've got your closed strength fields. Um, and what you have to do is you have to expand those around the background. So it's not just the background value, it's background plus fluctuation, and expand it out. Uh, there are first order terms. Yeah, like just take the dilaton for example. There's a, there's a dilaton fluctuation just sitting there. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to imagine what Feynman died. Yeah, I'm about to draw. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is do those closed string tadpoles, how do they affect my SUNF? Mill speeds. Well, in order to couple, I would need uh, need to use a V21 vertex. So for example, let's look at the correction to uh, Yang Mill's propagator. My gravitational tadpole it propagates down, and then it's going to couple, kind of like a loop correction, with a VC1 vertex to my Yang Mills propagators. And I have to consider, therefore, not just V01 by itself, but the product of the strengths of V01 and V21. And when you do that, what you find is that this will be suppressed relative to the tree level if the following holds. NF over NC times NC GP squared to the Q minus P over Q phi minus P is much less than one. So this is what people really should mean when they say they're going to work in a program. So note it's not just NF much less than NC. Okay? That's only true, it's kind of intuitive if you think about it. Right? NF much less than NC, that's the right description if Q is P, meaning I'm dealing with the same types of D brains, comparing apples with apples. But if I got different dimension brains, then the probe limit is different. So for example, if Q is less than P, then this is large and negative, I bring it over here, it's large and positive. I could actually have NF of order NC, not a problem. Whereas if Q is bigger than P, I actually need to impose something stronger than is what's usually called the problem. 
order to really have a justified cancellation. What is GP? Um, GP is the toast, uh, oh, it's just the Yang Mills couplet, the dimensionless Yang Mills. So it's like mu, another way to think about mu is it's like a renormalization scale. The scale at which I measure the, the dimensionful Yang Mills couplet. Okay, but another interesting point is that we can always achieve this. So I can always work in this probe limit, given the restrictions that we talked about on Q's and P's from the beginning. As long as those are met, I can do this. So I can study this non-abelian yang mills theory on these probe brains and say that it is giving me the right leading order description of this big system for those degrees of freedom. For those open strength degrees of freedom. And now I can apply holography to see what I learned. Okay, so what we did um, is actually just focus um, on the vacuum structure. What? What? Is that true? Well, so something is happening, so I guess you're decoupling, so it's not back reacting on the closed string side, otherwise you would change the geometry. That's right. That's basically what you're doing. That's right. So what I'm, what I'm achieving by imposing this together with the tilt coupling and NC being appropriately large is that I'm suppressing the back reaction on the closed string sector and I'm suppressing higher derivative corrections. Okay. So let's take a little look at the vacuum structure. Of these theories. Uh, it's already pretty interesting. Um, so I actually need a lot of space, so I can this. But this, yeah. so you showed an example, but it also fit the dominant part or something? Because how many of these do you have to check? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, I only showed you the gauge field propagator, but by supersymmetry, I mean, like if we start thinking about what like counter terms would look like, supersymmetry is going to constrain all of them to be related to find out the corrections. How that goes that should be enough. Okay, so we have this big class of Yang Mills theories on these curved spaces, which I erased, right? The metric on. Right? But they're these embedded spaces within this holographic setup. So the moral of this story about the vacuum structure is that SCS and Simons actually, remember, our background has a Ramon Ramon flux turned on. This contributes to this Yang Mills theory, the V20. It makes it interesting. Okay, so we looked at three classes of examples. So, and they're the ones that you might guess if you thought about these systems. So dp, dp plus 4, intersecting and d equals p, right? So the color brains are entirely in the flavor brains. dp, dp plus 2, and then d equals p minus 1. So the setup I started with, the d3, d5 system, is in this category. And then dp, dp. D equals P minus T. So co-dimension two defect. Okay, so what I want to do is schematically show you the terms that appear in V20 because of the turn signs. So for this system here, it's just the background C. Wedge, trace, wedge F. Because our flavor brains have four extra spatial directions, 
be on the color brain, the background C is going to soak up all of the common directions, the legs along the common directions, and we have four more that we can soak up. So then that's what uh, In this case, it's trace of pullback. We're going to pull back one leg of C, and then we're going to wedge with F. And what that ends up looking like is this is the Myers non abelian pullback that you do. So it looks like a covariant derivative of the one Higgs field we have. So in this setup, there's one direction that um, the color brains extend in that the flavors don't. So this is a Higgs field on the flavor brain. Y is the one Y direction we have in this setup. And we wedge that guy with a single F. This one is kind of the most intricate with respect to how these terms contribute. So I can either pull back C using with two legs, or I can do one of these interior products on C and then wedge that result with an F, and we have both. So this contributes. So the first one is like a D. So now there's two Y pipe directions. So this is like a D phi Y1, D phi Y wedge, D phi Y2 term. And this one is a commutator of those two phi's. Wedge with the F. So we have these terms in this Yang Mills theory. Remember, C is going to be evaluated on some explicit background. Okay? What they do is they conspire with a subset of terms from the DPI to give us complete squares in a non trivial way. So in the, over here, I'm going to write pieces of the field theory Hamiltonian, which utilize these terms. So this one I'm gonna, allows me to complete a square. The coefficients are just right to achieve this. Now this square, um, I'm just going to remind you that the four directions we have um, where this is interesting are these R directions which are transverse to the common intersection, but along the flavor lines. And then, this is a supersymmetric theory. So I know I have to be able to write the Hamiltonian as a sum of squares. Here I'm just exhibiting an interesting one, too, which exists because of these trend signs. Here, it looks like this. So we've got three R-type directions. Got two types of terms. So I'm now introducing a complex Higgs, and I'll think of my two R directions as a complex R direction. Moduli spaces are of instantons, monopoles, and vortices on spaces that are topologically R4, R3, and R2. So these are the spaces, parameter, the directions parameterized by these R directions, but carry on trivial energy. So 
So let me just give you one example of this metric. So for the monopole case, what's the metric where these mono, where I'm solving this equation? What's this star? What's the metric in this star? Okay. So uh, what one ends up finding? So I'll call that metric G tilde, and it's got some conformal factor which vanishes when P is three. Got this funny uh, R dependence uh, when we have a non-zero Z naught. So if there's a deformation, Z naught is a deformation parameter. And then we've got a two sphere. So metrically, the space when Z naught is zero is a cone over a two sphere, which either has a deficit or an excess angle, depending on whether P is less than three or bigger than three. And if Z naught is non-zero, we deform the tip of that cone to something nice and smooth. And I want to stress that these are vacua of the theory, okay? Because I'm only turning on my fields in these R-type directions. I'm maintaining complete translational invariance along the common intersection directions. And that's why they are vacuum. They have the Lorentz symmetries of the d plus one dimensional space time where the intersection is. And this probe brain is supposed to be giving me a holographically dual description of that defect theory with that symmetry. So they really are just vacuum. Um, so in the last couple minutes, I just want to kind of, it's like you guys know very well that DP brains that are dissolved and DP plus four brains look like instant. That's an old story going back probably to Douglas's brains and brains paper. Um, how does this fit in with what was known? Let me just kind of quickly summarize the story uh, for the instanton case. So here's my dp plus one. And here's my dissolved dp. So there's a couple of different points of view. How do we isolate, how do we see that instanton? How do we isolate those instantum degrees of freedom and describe it? Well, we can either view this as a co-dimension for defect and the dp plus 4 with a non-zero energy density. And then we would get the instanton degrees of freedom by doing a collective coordinate on time the dp plus 4. So to isolate those degrees of freedom. We can also describe it from the lower dimensional point of view. Okay, this is all old stuff too. Um, if we isolate the theory on the dps, what do we get? We have some super young mills plus hypermultiple. coming from the PQ strings. And D and F flatness in that theory are equivalent to the ADHM constraints, which gives you another formulation of the instanton. So that's how you see you have instantons from that point of view. Now these two points of view are flat space pictures. In one picture, I've got a finite or non-zero energy density defect. In the other picture, I'm describing vacuum, vacuum of the theory. How can those two things be consistent? Well, the low energy limit I take to talk about a field theory and a dp plus four dimensional world volume versus the low energy I would take to talk about a field theory and a dp are different low energy limits. I can hold one Yang-Mills coupling fixed, but not both. 
So that's why it's okay that these are two different types of things, some defect versus some vacuum. What I just talked about over here is a third point of view. All right, it's the same low energy limit as this one. We're talking about vacuum because we're taking the low energy limit where we hold the DP, yang Mo's coupling, fixed. But I'm giving you a holographically dual description. So point of view three, I get like one or two minutes. Point of view three replace an order one fraction of the color rings with the geometry they produce. Then the remaining ones are described as instant ones. But not in a flat space theory. In the curved space, being those six theory that we just talked about. That's a good description, apparently, when NC is large. So the conjecture then is that holography seems to imply the following about instantaneous moduli spaces and more generally cortex and monopole moduli spaces at large instanton charge. There exists sub loci in these moduli spaces. which are equivalently described as instanton moduli spaces, but for instantons on a curved space. So here, at large instanton, there are a sub loci of ordinary instanton moduli space, instantons of flat space. Which are equivalently described as moduli spaces of instantons on one of these curved spaces. And so well, that's one of the things we'd like to investigate more deeply going further. The way to do that would be to look at the dual field theory. So this picture came from supergravity description where we have an embedded from the defect holographic dual. You would still be realizing ADHM to get these vacuums. But now the claim is that at some large instant time charge, there must be a way to solve ADHM in some sort of saddle point at large charge, which will then realize this sub loci. It's a sub locus realize this description. So there is a, I didn't just make that idea myself, uh, it comes from, it's very well motivated, something uh, rather remarkable and beautiful happens when you study, similar, uh, when, you, when you study ordinary instantons as D minus one brains in the classic ADS five times S5 correspondence. At large and C, you can do a saddle point solution of the ADHM construction. You can see the geometry, ADS five times S5, actually emerge from the reduced measure on, his, on this moduli space. So this would be somewhat analogous to that. Um, uh, okay, let's stop there.